the latest shakeup on the offensive line, the latest woes in Whippeal recruiting, the new Pitt basketball schedule is out. We got a lot to get to on today's Wednesday potpourri, pitpourri, I guess if we want to kick it old school, pitpourri edition of the Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash Pantheleric.com. Yeah, the pit that was that was old school, man. If you go long, if you go way back on Pantheleric.com, you you might remember pit That was like on Tuesdays, just sort of a general collection of notes, news and notes heading into that week's matchup, and we called it pit and it And it was just a general notebook. It was mostly stuff that we got out of the game notes, like, hey, that's interesting. You know, the, the game notes would be uh, handed out by Pitt, the official game notes, and they'd be like 30 pages long. And we would parse it down to like the most interesting things, the things we thought you were interested in. And we called it pit Puri as opposed as like a take on potpourri. Um, man, I haven't thought about that in years. That just popped into my head. The pit Puri. Wow. Yeah, we got a bit of a pit Puri for you here on uh, today's morning pit. I'm going to stop saying that because I don't really. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, it, it looks weird on paper and it's even weirder to say out loud. But we got a lot of topics to cover, a lot of things to get to today you know the deal you know what we always ask you to do like this video and subscribe to our youtube channel youtube.com slash pantheleric.com that way you never miss any of our uh, pit video content these morning pit videos daily you know monday through friday every day of the week a little bit of pit sports talk to get your day started i listen to a lot of sports talk radio and and i understand why it's the case but i mean there's just not a lot of pit talk happening i mean it's all Steelers right now and understandably so i i, I get it why it's all Steelers right now that's where the interest is that's why a lot of the interest is um, even in Pitt's good seasons, that's where a lot of the interest is. And when they're one in three, there's even less interest to go around. I understand that. But I also understand that you as a Pitt fan are still interested in Pitt and still want to have those Pitt conversations. And so that's what we do for you right here on the morning Pitt. We get your day started with a little bit of Pitt sports talk on youtube.com slash pantholaircom. So if you like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you won't miss any of our pit video content. We also have video interviews up there. You should definitely check out the interview with Kenny Johnson from yesterday. It was outstanding. The freshman wide receiver did a great job. It was it was great to talk to him. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, so you should definitely check that out. And everything else we have, in addition to you know these morning pit videos, we have our live show tonight, the Panther Lair show, tonight at 8 p.m., 8.30 p.m. Me and Jim Hammock get together to talk a little pit sports. So that's uh, something else to look forward to. And, of course, our post-game shows on Saturday after the game, we'll have one after the Virginia Tech game, probably like around 11, 11.30, somewhere around there. We'll talk talk about the game for an hour. It's a live, local, post-game show. It's local, but it's also something you can tune into from anywhere. You don't want to miss it. Like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to youtube.com slash pantholaircom. You can turn on notifications and you'll get uh, an alert sent to your phone so you never miss any of our videos or live streams or anything like that. And then check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. The most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. It's all there, pantherlair.com, and message boards to interact with hundreds and thousands of other pit fans. All day, every day, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. All right, let's jump into it. Um, I talked about it a little bit at the end of yesterday's show, uh, but I, I wanted to delve into it a little bit more. Mac and Salve's... Uh, lost for the season. Pat Narduzzi announced it on Monday. He played two games for Pitt. Started three games, I guess. It was the West Virginia game when he got hurt. Uh, did not play against North Carolina. And Narduzzi announced on Monday that he's going to be out for the season. Gonzalez is a redshirt senior. Um, has that COVID year that he could come back in 2024 if he's so inclined. Talking to Dave Vorbilly yesterday, it sort of felt like he doesn't expect Gonzalez to come back, but you know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna read too much into that. That's probably a decision that Matt and his family have to make, and I'm, I'm sure with a lot of feedback and input from uh, NFL scouts and people around the league who are gonna tell him, yeah, you should come out now, or no, you should go back and uh, try to. You know, you can improve your draft stock by going back for another year. Uh, it's just, it's, it's unfortunate. It's disappointing because I mean, he was really was one of the the. I don't want to say one of the rocks of this team and of this offense uh, because rocks is what they call their scout team. And he was certainly not a scout team player, although he impressed the coaches a lot during his time on scout team back in 2019. It's funny. You think back to 2019. I mean, he was, he was a true freshman in 19. He was a redshirt freshman in 2020, the COVID year. And if you recall that COVID year, um, I think it was the Virginia tech game, right? So they, they got, they got trashed by 
Notre Dame at home had the off week. It was one of the lowest points. Still, I, I would contend lower than what we're at right now. If you think it's bad with the fire Narduzzi posts and fire this guy, fire that guy, fire the program posts right now, it was worse at that point in 2020, and I believe it. I, I, I mean, I, I believe that wholeheartedly, and anyone who's being honest about it would remember that as well. Paris Ford just quit the team and all that stuff. Anyway, they go down to Florida State, get a really inspiring win. They come back home, and I think the next week they played Virginia Tech. And they played Virginia Tech, um, missing like literally like 18 guys were in the, I forget what they called it, like the contact protocol or something like that. A bunch of guys were out to the point where like pit coaches were like, why are we even playing this game? Why? Because you remember like they, they would get to a certain point where if enough guys were out due to contact, uh, close contact and, and positive tests and all of that, they, they would actually cancel or postpone a game if you if they didn't feel like you had enough healthy, available players to have a, a, a safe game. And so Pitt was like Pitt people were wondering like why are, why is this game not getting canceled? We have so many guys out due to the you know contact protocols or whatever it was called. And among those players who were out were was at least Carter Warren and probably some more offensive linemen because Mack and Salves ended up playing in that game and he also started and played the entire Clemson game a week later. Which, if you recall, the Virginia Tech game was an inspiring performance by Pitt. Uh, to come out under those circumstances, Jordan Addison was out. Kenny Pickett was still banged up, but he played. They had all those offensive linemen. All these guys out, and they end up winning a pretty inspiring game. And then they go down to Clemson, they get destroyed. And I might have those games too uh, mixed up. I forget if uh, Clemson came first or Virginia Tech. Either way, Gonsalves steps in in those two games, starts to play the whole game, played a lot in the Georgia the season finale against Georgia Tech, and was actually really good. I don't think he gave up a sack, even in the Clemson game. You know, gave up like one pressure or something like that. No pressures allowed in the uh, um, in the Virginia Tech game. So, I mean, he came off the he came in as a redshirt freshman and played really well. Fast forward to 2021, Carter Warren's back. All those guys are back. Gonzalez gets relegated um, to to a backup job. He's behind Warren and Gabe Hoy. He ends up playing a lot. I think Hoy got hurt, a, you know, a decent amount. He started like six games that year or something. You know, played a lot and played well. And then he goes into 2022, all those guys come back, Warren and Hoy. Gonzalez disappointed by his own admission, considered transferring uh, because he wanted to have an opportunity to play as a redshirt junior. And then it ended up Hoy got hurt and then Warren got hurt and Gonzalez started every game last season. And according to Pro Football Focus, you can take whatever you want from this. He didn't give up a single sack all of last season. Now, we can debate about Pro Football Focus's numbers and analytics and all that stuff. I'm... I'm carving that one in stone about Gonzalez. I am. I will take it to my grave that he did not allow a sack last season because I think he really is that good. And he was one of the cornerstone foundation pieces of this team coming into the season. Uh, he was a voted a captain. And I think he was voted a captain for a reason uh, because of the position he holds on this team and the stature he, he carries. He was a quiet, soft-spoken guy. I don't think he was going to get in people's faces, but he held people to a certain standard by the level of his own play. I think he was a good leader in that way, and he was a great player on the field, and and he will be missed. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, his absence led to yet another shuffling on the offensive line, which we saw. Um, he wasn't the only one uh, to miss the Carolina game. Jake Cradle was also out. That put Terrence Moore in at center. Um, you know, Blake Zaboving and Jason Collier with you know held on to the starting um, guard jobs that they had at West Virginia. But then when Gonsalves out, Branson Taylor had to move from right tackle to left tackle and Ryan Bear stepped into the starting lineup at right tackle. My guess is you'll see that same offensive line this week uh when they go to Virginia Tech. I'm I, if I had to if I had to guess and, and this isn't based on inside info or anything like that, my guess is you'll see Taylor Zabovic, Moore, Collier, Bear and that'll be your starting five. And to be honest, I thought they were okay. You know, I, I I don't think they were good. I think they still gave up pressures. Um, Pitt's quarterback still got sacked twice. They still had pressure in their face. Even when they didn't get sacked, they were getting hit. Uh, they took shots. They got chased. They had to escape the pocket. I mean, Phil Dracovic and Christian Veyer did not have an easy time of it on Saturday night against North Carolina because the offensive line is still a work in progress. But I thought there were times where they looked solid, you know, and, and looked like okay 
they might be okay here. They, like this, this group might actually be able to play together a little bit. And I thought in particular the, the the interior, which was not affected by the Gonsalves absence, but the interior with Zabovic, Moore, and Collier, I thought was about as good as we've seen out of the interior offensive line so far this season. Now, I think they were facing less of a challenge against North Carolina's defensive line, and particularly the interior defensive linemen, than they were certainly against Cincinnati and maybe even against West Virginia. Um, but I thought that, I mean, there were running lanes. There were running lanes right up the middle, uh, which wasn't really the case in the first two games. I mean, first two real games, you know what I mean? The Cincinnati and West Virginia game. They, they, it, those running lanes were not there in the Big 12 portion of Pitt's schedule in, uh, you know, this season. But I thought they were there, not consistently, not all night, but I thought they were there against North Carolina um, you know, more than they had been the previous two weeks. So that's a kudos to Zabovic and Moore and Collier. I think if they're able to get that lineup back out there again, nobody else gets hurt this week. Nobody else has lost because this is now Gonzalez is out for the season. Ryan Jacoby's out for the season. Jake Cradle is, you know, unknown. But like I say, I mean, he didn't play at all. You know, he didn't even suit up for the uh, North Carolina game. And my guess is he won't play this week. So you're down three starters due to injury. Um, and really just retaining the two starters of Blake Zabovic and, and Branson Taylor. And neither one of those guys is playing the position that we thought they were going to play at the beginning of the season. They, neither one of those guys, uh, you know, if that lineup sticks for the Virginia Tech game, the lineup they use against Carolina, if they use that against Virginia Tech, you'll have nobody playing the position they were start, you know, projected to start at the beginning of the season. Not one. Three starters out due to injury, two moving to different positions, somewhat due to those injuries. So that's a challenging situation. Uh, but again, I thought they showed some positive signs. Virginia Tech has been susceptible to the run. I think I talked about this yesterday. They've given up like 200 rushing yards to almost everybody they faced. I think the only team that didn't rush for 200 yards was maybe Purdue, who rushed for like a buck 80 and three touchdowns. So you should be able to run on Virginia Tech. And this makeshift offensive line, this thrown together offensive line that will finally maybe have some consistency if you get the same line about there two weeks in a row, should be able to have success as well. One final thing on the running game, just because I was looking this up uh, in a Twitter conversation, someone questioned about, you know, I, I said yesterday that Pitt needed to be committed to the run and they said, look, Pitt has been committed to the run. Somebody on Twitter, and, and this was, this is not calling out a troll or something. It was a good conversation. And uh, once I get done recording this video, I'll go see what they said and we'll go back and forth, I think. But they, 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 they said, look, Pitt came out in those last two games, West Virginia and North Carolina, and they were committed to the run, but the defenses made adjustments and took them out of it, and they couldn't run anymore. I, I just don't buy that. I'll buy that the game was out of reach by you know early in the third quarter against North Carolina. Um, the Carolina went up 18, and it became more difficult for Pitt to try to rely on the run. But I look at you know this Carolina game, Pitt scores you know on its first two drives, right? They, they, they score touchdowns on, on the first two drives. They're up 14 to nothing. <clears throat> the rest of the first half, they handed the ball to the running backs three times. They ran 15 plays on offense, uh, or, or 16, I guess, counting the Bay Area pass. 16 plays on offense from there until the end of the first half, and they handed the ball to the running backs three times. And then, as I said yesterday, in the second half, the running backs only had three carries. So you go, I, I mean... Let me look at this again, because as I'm saying it, I almost can't believe that that's actually true. Here, first drive, Rodney Hammond carries the ball one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, including the touchdown run, right? Great stuff. Second drive, Hammond carries the ball one, two, um, he carried the ball twice on that drive, and, and, and uh, Daniel Carter carried it once. So, I mean, you're looking at 10, 12 carries, whatever it is. The next drive, Rodney Hammond, this is Pitt's third drive of the game. Pitt's up 14-7. to Game script has not taken Pitt out of the run. They can still use it. Rodney Hammond carries the ball one time, and they go three and out. Pitt's next drive, the game is tied. Rodney Hammond does not carry the ball once. The next drive, Pitt is down 21-17 after giving up a punt return touchdown. Uh, or Pitt's down 21-14, excuse me, after a punt return touchdown. Rodney Hammond carries the ball twice. Okay. And then you get to the final drive uh, of the half where it was screen, screen, Dracovic run, Bayer pass. So you're looking at three rushing attempts, two touchdown drives, 
three running back rushing attempts the rest of the first half, three in the second half. So all the rushing attempts that they had in that game, I think they had 16. 10 out of those 16 came on the first two drives. I'm going down the hole again about the commitment to the running game, but it just blows my mind that we're still talking about this as if a Panarduzzi, Frank Signetti team should have any question uh, in its dedication to and commitment to running the ball. Look, I was going to talk about five topics today. I'm already like 15 minutes into this because I got sidetracked talking about the running game again. Run the ball. All right, we got to move on because we got a lot of things to talk about. Let's talk about recruiting. Not a good stretch the last couple of days for Pitt. Not a good stretch in the whippy of the last couple of days. Tyke Hayes, the four-star running back from Aliquippa, committed to Penn State. On uh, Monday, yesterday, Brady O'Hara, tight end, maybe offensive tackle, jumbo athlete from North Catholic, committed to Penn State. Both guys in the 2025 recruiting class. That makes them juniors right now. A little bit early for them to be recruiting or to be committing, but let's be honest. I think they were both at that whiteout game on Saturday night. Yeah. Looks like it would be pretty fun to play in that kind of environment, doesn't it? Uh, we can all say what we want about the um, magic of living in State College for uh, you know uh, the the rest of the year. I always say that you know if, if you're Pitt and and a, a a a recruit or a parent comes to you and says, I don't know, man. You know, we, we went to a game the other day. There were 110,000 people there. I, I came to your game and there were 48,000. If I'm Pitt, I'm saying, yeah, like you're, you're not wrong. I, I mean, I can't argue. I can't disagree with you. I'm not going to try and convince you that what you saw is not the case. That's a great atmosphere. It's a great atmosphere in Columbus. It's a great atmosphere in Ann Arbor. It's a great atmosphere in State College. It's a great atmosphere. I'm not going to deny that. Um, we don't have that kind of crowd on a consistent basis. We don't have that kind of crowd seven you know, Saturdays a year. We don't. We just don't draw those kind of numbers. We have some games where it fills up or it gets close to filling up and the atmosphere is amazing. It's great. I hope you guys can come and see that kind of game. But that's just not what we... We don't have that consistently. You're right. And we hope you'll come and be a part of the success that will bring more people out to the stands and all that. But let me also put it to you this way. You're going to get to play... If you go up to one of those schools, you're going to play in front of 100,000 people seven times a year. For the other 358 days in the year... You still have to live in state college. Think of you know you need to think about that. Don't just think about the seven days where you're playing in front of a hundred thousand people. Think about the other three hundred fifty eight days where you're living in state college. And and I don't I don't say this like this is not me being demeaning to state college. I don't want to live in state college. But I mean that that's got to be the recruiting pitch. You know what I mean? That's how you counter. Uh, some of those recruiting things now if somebody's talking about ohio state and columbus that's a little tougher because columbus is a pretty good city um but that's i think the the, the counter to that but o'hara and and hayes both standouts from the 2025 class locally both going to penn state after uh, being at the whiteout game on saturday night looked like an awesome environment smart for them as someone pointed out to me smart for penn state to schedule their whiteout game against ohio or against iowa since they often schedule it against like Iowa State or, or Ohio State or somebody that they're going to lose to, they scheduled against uh, they scheduled against Iowa so they can make sure they can get a win out of it. That was good planning on their part as well. Um, Hayes and O'Hare, it's disappointing for Pitt to lose those guys. They're in that 2025 recruiting class, not quite as strong, not quite as deep uh, locally as some of the classes around it. I think the 2024 class had more has more depth. Those are the guys who are seniors right now. 2026 and 27 are looking pretty strong and pretty deep as well. Those are the sophomores and the freshmen, respectively. 2025, not quite as deep, not quite as strong. And that's not to say that Hayes and O'Hara are bad prospects. Rather, it's to say that there's kind of a drop-off after the top three or four guys, maybe five, locally. And that makes it sting even more if you're Pitt and you're trying to recruit the Whitfield, you're trying to recruit the City League, and two of the best players in that class just came off the board in the last two days. Um, and two of the guys that you were seriously pursuing. Pitt only has probably five offers out. I just, really just had a spreadsheet up about this. Um, in the 25 class, they have, I believe they have five offers out right now. And uh, lo uh, locally, you know what I mean? Whippeal City League, 20, uh, you know, five offers out in that 2025 recruiting class. And now two of those five are already committed elsewhere. Um, of the remaining three, I mean, I think they'll probably get one. 
And that's just the reality of it. And and I shouldn't say it like that. Like it's some big surprise. I mean, like we've been watching this story unfold for years and it's unfolded for a lot of years under a lot of coaches that Pitt is just not going to own Western Pennsylvania the way it once did. If it ever actually did, you know, it didn't, Pitt didn't own Western Pennsylvania under Dave Wanstead. Um, they lost recruits all the time. They lost kids to Ohio state. They lost kids to Notre Dame. They lost kids to Penn state. You know, Todd Graham and Paul Chris certainly didn't own Western Pennsylvania and Pat Narduzzi's had his moments, but there have always been guys who have gotten away, which is always the case. It has always been the case that there are guys who have gotten away. So they did really well in 2016, but they still didn't get Kalik Hudson. They did really well in 2021, but they still, <laughs> this is funny. They still didn't get Derek Davis or Donovan McMillan. Uh, you look at the top five guys in the Whippeal from that, that year, it was like Elliot Donald, Nikai Johnson, Dorian Ford, Donovan McMillan, and Derek Davis. They're all here now, but they didn't get all five of those guys coming out of high school. Guys will always go away. You'll always lose guys. Does it sting more when you lose two of the top players in a relatively shallow class and they go to Penn State and Penn State is rolling in the top 10 program right now and you're one in three? Yeah. It's just like, damn. But it's not anything new. And and maybe it's a loser mentality to say, well, you just accept it. You just understand that that's going to be the case. But I have a hard time believing that there's a time where that won't be the case. And and I say that not as a, a, a bash on Pitt, but just rather Penn State loses guys out of the whip you know what I mean? Like, like there are Whippeal targets who go to Notre Dame, who go to Michigan, who go to Ohio State. They go to, you know, like I mentioned, Davis and McMillan. Penn State wanted those guys. And McMillan went to Florida and Davis went to LSU. You're always going to lose guys. There's no, no one school has a monopoly on the Whippeal. No one school can say, if we go in there for a guy in the Whippeal, we're getting that guy. And quite frankly, the schools that probably have the best chance of pulling off that, like, you know, a you know, a, a success rate in the Whippeal above 90% are probably like Notre Dame, Ohio State, probably, maybe Michigan. Like those schools, and and I only, and, and and we don't see the numbers go this way because those schools are a little more selective in who they go after in the Whippeal. Um, but I mean, I think those schools, if they act, if they if they wanted to take the top five, if Notre Dame wanted the top five kids in the Whippeal, and and put the full court press on them, they would probably get them all. And they would beat Pitt and Penn State for them. And and probably Ohio State. You know, and sort of the same thing. If Ohio State put a full court press, I don't think that Penn State is winning every battle there. They, they might get one out of five or something like that. So my point is, Pitt never got all the guys out of the Whippeal, and they probably never will get all the guys out of the Whippeal. Um, they always just need to get some guys out of the Whippeal. And what stings in this case, like I say, with the 2025 class is that it's not that deep and it's not that strong. And so that makes it a little bit more, you know, frustrating, disappointing, discouraging when you lose guys uh, like Hayes and O'Hara this early in the process, uh, you know, guys who, who you were really after, especially Hayes. I mean, this is a running back from El Quipa. It's unfortunate, but that that's... That's where recruiting is right now. That's where pit recruiting is right now. That's where Whippeal recruiting is right now. Um, you're you're gonna miss. You're gonna miss on guys, and and you just have to get some of your top targets. Ideally, at least a couple of your top targets. And um, you know, 2025 is looking like they probably won't get too many of them. Um, 2024, I think they got a decent number of their top targets, but I mean, they still obviously missed on some of the the biggest names like Quentin Martin, Quentin Martin, and Anthony Specco. Um, you know, try and work on 2026. There's some really good players in the 26 class. There's some really good players in the 27 class. Uh, work on those guys. Get what you can get. All right. We got to talk about the pit basketball schedule, uh, but we're kind of out of time. I, I don't like these things to go too far past 20 minutes. I feel like your attention span starts to wane, which I understand. Uh, so we'll have to get into the hoops basketball schedule tomorrow. Uh, just too many fun things, that, too many things to talk about. We'll, we'll hit a bunch of topics again tomorrow. It'll be like pit Puri part two. I said I wasn't going to say that again, but here I am. I can't help myself. Thanks for tuning in today. Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget the live show tonight, 8.30 p.m. Me and Jim Hammett talking a little pit sports with you right here at youtube.com slash So thanks for tuning in today. Hope you've had a great week so far. 
Enjoy your Wednesday. We'll be back with you for the live stream tonight and in the morning pit tomorrow right here, youtube.com slash pantalaircom.